both on. <clears throat> All right, let me know when we're ready. I am ready, sort of. Video. Our apologies, we're having a little bit of technical complications. Of course, I was really glad. But it became a compulsion in college, studying under his mentor, Peter Minke at Eckerd College. Peter's influence is easily seen by the vivid imagery and the truthful diction of Blue's poems. So I give you Mr. Blue. Some years back, um, my brother asked me to join him in Amsterdam to celebrate his birthday. And we were just walking down a street and decided we'd have a bar, a beer, and just went to this hole in the wall bar. And as we're sitting there, I hear jazz playing and I look around the bar and there's these huge uh, posters of different jazz musicians and singers. And so that's what inspired this. It's called Amsterdam Jazz. Could I get a little light? That's good, that's perfect. Thank you. Jazz in the city with the tobacco yellowed lights. Dance through centuries old glass. Play on cool, moist air. Blood of the city reflects spiral neon. Move with your boats. Cigarette fog floats over canals. Feet and pedaled wheels pass by, distorted through the glass. Night watch. Mr. Rich sits next to me on a poster from 1956. Billy raises her martini and sings me across the black salt water. I turn my ear to the cold night jazz in the city with the tobacco yellowed lights. For I have miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Visiting New York some years back, there was an art exhibit where different artists were given these cows to paint and they placed them all around the city. So this is called New York Cows. The cows are loose in Central Park. They picket in front of the tavern on the green, claiming their inalienable bovine rights have been violated. And one with a bullhorn leads a solidarity chant Unfair to ruminant animals. Next, they run, stampeding toward the old carousel, striking poses, imitating the elegant horses fixed on brass poles. The cows are loose in Central Park, chewing their cud on sheep's meadow, fertilizing strawberry fields forever. The police try to arrest their owners for not having them on a leash, but this is a revolution. Throw off your chains of slavery. We are more than milk and meat. We demand equal pay for equal work. The cows are loose in Central Park, skating a woman dressed in their tutus, racing their boats on the sailboat pond. Call the mayor. The cows are loose in Central Park.
This one's called Waiting, and there's a lot of imagery drawn through classical literature. I wait for you. We have not set a time, but I watch the clock on my nightstand and wait for you. I believe it will be today, but in reality, we never committed to this. The owl outside my window told me you were coming, but the cry of the hawk disguised your time. I cut a pomegranate, hoping you will find it sweet and stay a while. It sits at the table I've set. I fill our glasses and watch the condensation turn to drops and run down the sides. The ice melts as I wait for you. 12 hours have passed, but you have not arrived. I wonder if you don't like pomegranates and replace it with grapes, then oranges. I try to prepare for a guest I have never met. I watch the clock. Minutes and hours which I share, which I wish to share with you pass in solitude. I listen to the steps disappear outside my door and wonder when you will arrive. Unfortunately, I think my next poem is all too familiar with those people in a long-term relationship, sex before coffee. Early fall morning, still warm with summer sun, 10.30 and finally find a hidden bag of French roast. She grinds the whole bag and makes us four cups, lead, to the bed while the coffee drop drips gently clothes come off laid in his and her piles skin remembering when it was not a rare occasion i know there are some scientists here i am not a scientist but i am a science geek and that's where the imagery from this poem comes from. It's called Measurement. Bubble universe rises to the surface of the multiverse. Wormhole emerges in foreign quadrants, lost in space, never re to return home again. Search for familiar constellations in uncharted dimensions. Quasars meet quarks, quantum frenzy, red paradox shift of approaching fatherhood. This one's self-explanatory. God experiences writer's block. In the beginning, there was the creative word, mystical pen on a papyrus of space and time, an illustrated book, a pure, did, did God, God filled day and night, land and water, plants and animals, men and women? Did God create metaphor? Origin with no beginning, great unknowable essence, grandfather spirit, omnipotent power with no limit. Did you really rest on the seventh day? Or was it writer's block? And why does everything taste like chicken? I used to live in a little town east of here, New Bern, North Carolina. And once a year they have an art exhibit. Oh, it's go. And they choose one of those poems, one of those works of art and they write a poem and there's a contest and the book is published of those things and got honorable mention for this one it's called wishes a small as a small child i'd tease her 
saying, I wanted a Viking funeral, setting me out to sea on a small burning wooden boat, flames guiding me to colder depths. Decades later, after other deaths, uncle, aunt, mother, we had the talk. Wishes of cremation, placing no value on dead body, economical and environmental, ashes to be placed near mountain stream. But when the time came, she couldn't hold the thought of daddy's body being placed in a furnace, her Jewish half equating it with other atrocities. So I am lowered into the earth, passing green grass, dry brown topsoil into Carolina red clay. Cooler than the flames, it feels like autumn all year long. On Sundays, she comes with flowers and wishes. This was inspired by one of my favorite poets, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who was a beat. It's called Now. Now is the time I see kids walk in the street, forgotten angels from a forgotten holy war, fought over only God knows what. Fallen from the earth from the 13th floor, bad luck, ain't got no good luck. And I say, what the, hey, does anyone know what time it is? Now is the time I see kids walk in the street, packing loaded words, patriot script, parrot screamed into the sky, burned out empty stairwell, Falling to the earth from the 13th floor. Bad luck, ain't got no good luck. And I say, what the, hey, does anybody know what time it is? Now is the time I see kids walking the street, German tanks in the Chinese square, rolling over amber waves of God, left off the US census honor roll. Falling to the earth from the 13th floor. Bad luck, ain't got no good luck. And I say, what the, hey, does anybody know what time it is? Now is the time, kids. Now is the time, now. This I wrote for, I call him a kid who's younger than me, but um, he exposed poetry and acoustic music, which I used to run down in South Florida. It's called, and I just thought this kid had everything. It's called Roaches. Cockroaches, no longer run from the turned on light, they have become accustomed to my routine. They wish me a good morning when I turn on the shower, checking the water to see if the temperature is safe to enter. They tell me to have a good day as I leave the apartment and go to the office. They think they know me. The roaches are there when I come home at night like a faithful dog, glad to see his master again. They rejoice as I open the refrigerator to make my evening sandwich and they run for the crumbs I leave on the counter. They think they know me. I'm dressed at time with wish me pleasant dreams and tell me story far off kingdom. They think they know me, they don't. For instance, do they know I'm going to kill myself today? I'm not even sure I do, but today I will find out. And to wrap it up, this is the quintessential image of anybody who has ridden the Long Island Railroad. Railroad, Railroad. Mr. Cool sits back in his seat on the Long Island Railroad. His stare never varies from some imagined spot in the middle of the car. From station to station, he keeps the pose, folded arms, feet spread wide. 
and donations. Baldwin, Merrick, Freeport, Wonton, Seaport, Massapequa, Massapequa Park, Amityville, Copac, Lindenhurst, and Babylon. Mr. Cool just sits. Still no sign of recognition. Mr. Cool just sits. Mr. Cool just sits. Mr. Cool just sits. All right, next up um, is Nick Beneselli, and I have his um, brief bio. <clears throat> I'm a librarian and currently live in Raleigh, North Carolina, born in New York City. I also lived in Austin, Texas for many years, where I attended the um, University of Texas at Austin. I have written and published reviews, short stories, and poems. I began writing in 2021 after a long hiatus, and several of my poems were published in various anthologies in 2022. And this last line, and I was going to ask you about this before, and it says 170 posted on two poetry websites. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a member of poetry.com. <laughs> I think I can speak about the short answer that's correct. I've got about 175 plus posted on at least one of those two websites and somewhat fewer on the other website. So I've written over 150 since the beginning of 2000, beginning of 2021. That's a lot of poems. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I think we might as well hold our applause until the end of the 15 minutes, just so you don't wear yourself out after each uh, poem. So, okay, Nick, you're up. Well, let me first say I'm a very reluctant uh, poetry reader. Um, I last did this in a truly public forum and I think 1982 in Austin and it didn't go terribly well and um, and uh, blue is a tough act to follow so uh, bear with me here. Um, I'm going to start with this one which is the longest but I don't think terribly long it's titled I almost wrote a poem I wrote this for a contest um, that um, the, the topic was uh, uh, Bukowski-like poems, so this is what I came up with. I need you and dream of you while I try to drink you away. I almost wrote a poem that began like this many years ago to express my unrequited infatuation for a certain beguiling and baffling woman. I almost wrote a poem that rambled on unpoetically about all the tormented feelings and dark ideas that poisoned my already warped mind. But instead, I drowned my sorrows and dragged my sorrowful, sardonic self through lowly jobs and lofty ideas like a Kafkaesque Sisyphus and erupted corrosive prose, parroting frenemies as friends became enemies. And I found myself submerged in a private Cold War with the world during the Cold War in the torrid, torpid river city where the alienated artisans ate their own. Maybe someday in the distant future, 2020s, if I'm still around, if the world is still around, I'll actually write this forgettable poem and wish I hadn't. Uh, the next one is one of my pleasanter ones, um, inspired by a trip to Myrtle Beach, the uh, first time I had been there uh, a little over a year ago, titled Myrtle Beach Visions. Flickering stars vibrate on the surface of the sea. Fluttering palm trees sprout out of the sand. Flying on a wheel in the sky, hovering above a beige blue land seascape, pulsing with waves, white foam, kites, sailboats. 
a bustling boardwalk, a vast calm ocean inviting freedom. And now we go a little dark here with this one, which matches the color of my shirt. Um, and I spent a lot of time revising part of this, uh, apocalyptic rituals. The nuclear snakes slither into disaster, warheads waiting in the dithering wings. Light explodes, darkness erupts, fiery projectiles obliterate without mercy. The reptilian warlords fumble through flames, apocalypse waiting within withering declarations. And I think I will spare you retrograde ruminations. That's a rather long and crazy one, unless you are hard up for something like that. There was the one I was most inclined to read that I forgot to print out. Uh, the Season of Hell is the title of this one. Serious sneers and terrestrial fools fiddle. Hateful heat domes crush and deflate as the earth smolders and the oceans sizzle in the season of hell. Apocalyptic eruptions decorate the dark, angry, turbulent skies, unleashing vertically cruel, scathing tsunamis in chaotic yet clockwork rituals as our incipient Anthropocene commences efficient anti-terraforming. We enter the gates of hell and become reptilian under the barking dog star. Um, I don't know how much time I have left if you want Okay, all right, I will tackle this one. <laughs> I think this goes beyond Bukowski in some ways. Um, this one's titled Retrograde Ruminations, and um, this is rather a uh, stream of consciousness and surreal, so just to warn you. I, of warped words and soundless mind, out of mindless sight, know somewhere blurring into the no-go realm chasing cunning cryptic clouds of thought crimes. I touch no man's land, out never where I'm supposed to be or not begin. I am there, not here, catastrophically contemplating caricatures of contorted mindscapes. I am here or there, out of control, cleverly out of sorts, sorting out sorted collusive clutter, evading enemies in the dog days of delusion, one dissolving poem at a time composing symphonies of poignant collapse, 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 while falling, falling. I am there heretofore hermetically hallucinating, elucidating zephyrs of hell. I am not here out there, but in the sordid awareness of concocted weaponized words. I'm here seeking terrifying star doom, sailing through the tragic comic mimetic means tumbling turbulently into the anti-universe. <clears throat> I send heat-seeking missives towards asteroid where alienated artisans eat alien space bats. My purpose deserved as I seek my missing muse from the musing minotaur and a peaceful OBE upward toward the new sphere. Whew. I guess I'm done. Thank you. Okay, so he chickened out doing this in person. And um, he sent us a, um, his poems, um, which Myra is going to take care of shortly. Uh, his bio is, Jay is a retired journalist, writer, editor, graphic designer from Northeast Ohio, who wrote almost all his poetry in high school and college. He believes in traditional poetry using things like rhyme and meter. And in adult life, he has written funny, entertaining poems for family, friends, and romantic interests. They don't require analysis or interpretation. So Jay was kind enough to send a very lovely file. Um, and John is helping me 
figure out why my computer is not showing up there. There's something going on with the system. It's being a little bit weird, but we're working on it. So brief station identification intermission. Because um, this thing's being a little grumpy, we're going to give you J sound, but no J picture. Good afternoon, everybody at the HSP. Glad to see my friends being absent here. I want to invite you to share a little bit of my poetry with you today. You and I have talked about poetry on the home over the years, and he knows that I'm a traditional speaker. Hear a lot of writing and certainly I hope a lot of meter rhythm in what I read in the next few minutes. And uh, I strongly believe that's what makes poetry poetry. You just bring words together. I was at and just bringing words together. Uh, that can be a challenge. It can certainly be done well. I'm not down playing that, but I like to use all of the uh, tools that language gives us when I write a poem. And the first one I'll start with. Uh, I wrote a poem in 13 and 14 at the most, maybe. And uh, it's a tribute to that fella up on my shoulder there that worked in fish. They're already thinking that such a kind of thing, except if I start this. And so I wrote a book to Charlie when I was in junior high. And this is how it goes. Too bad, Charlie. And then tell me the big deal. You're surely to this eye. And I'm riding to the end. So I have to go to the a little crazy, shut up, the abuse, you may good fertilizer. <laughs> that is maybe an you know, auspicious uh, launch to your career in poetry. Uh, it wasn't very lengthy, but I'll do occasionally right now. I was pretty prolific in high school. Uh, a lot of what I wrote was kind of dark. Uh, I wrote through college, and then I kind of slept off in the recent decades, but just right on occasion. Or a special event, a special friend, a family member, uh, someone I want to communicate with uh, in more than just words off the top of my head. Um, I think it goes a little bit up, but my hope is to be good. Not always. Um, now I'm going to read that I want to be like for a special, a very special person. When I work with the students, I may use a lot of my mid 20s, so I'm very old. And I was doing proliferations here, and I wrote a story about a girl named Roxanne Hunter. She was in her mid twenties, and she had a beautiful three-year-old daughter. We called Roxanne Rock for sure, and it fit her. She loved a lot. She had Crohn's disease. Long before the commercials for Crohn's medicine on television. Back then, uh, in the uh, probably 
meal, the plate sediments, it was uh, it was stated in the way of the intestines and the PKA diet. And Roxanne had been hospitalized for months uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, spent holidays there, Christmas, birthdays. Uh, before that, she did not. A private joke. A corner bus stop in Chicago late summer. It was around midnight. The city's dropping its shades. I just come from a bar, not high, just sort of relaxed, grateful for the wooden city bench that felt like a good seat at a theater. A young man came walking along with his dog on a long leather leash. The man didn't look at me and stood with his dog next to the street curb, looking down, it seemed, towards the street where the bus comes with the urbanite's perennial hope that it'll be there when he is. Suddenly, he let out too loud a laugh that rang in the silence of the night. A happy smile filled his boyish face. I realized then that he had been drinking. He laughed again, uh, I'm sorry, he laughed again at his private joke and then turned into the sitting dog. You son of a bitch, he said. You think you know everything. The dog looked up at him indifferently. The man smiled, continuing the tease, which now had a certain ambiguity. Just who the hell do you think you are? The dog perplexed, but with the patience only a dog can cultivate over the years, sat stoic and tolerant on the concrete curb. The man stood as if waiting for an answer. I saw the bus coming and stood up quickly as it swung into the curb, opening its doors. And the blind man, led by his dog, climbed in. The question left on the sidewalk in the night. <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice. Garbage in, garbage out. I'm worried about my footprint. the one that leaves environmental tracks. At time, I feel as guilty as a burglar whose muddy shoes lead right to his door. I try, and I'm one I add at a throwaway restaurant. I try and find the right receptacle. I feel everyone is watching me to see if I'm doing it right. I don't throw a thrash on the highway. It usually goes on the floor of my car. I know my car is polluting the car in back of me, and the guy in front of me is bringing me in. At home, I read the list of do's and don'ts, bottles, cans, light bulbs, cardboard boxes, plastic, no toxics, batteries, paint, flammables. I always have something that falls into nowhere. I'm sure a green priest knows that I drink sugar-free water, the ones that I need a pliers to open the top. I expect them to drive up in a Trump someday and throw all my empties on my lawn. I feel saintly when I pick up a piece of trash in the woods, as if this one solitary act is saving my environmental soul. And someday, So I'm, a, I'm an unrepentant, unreformed bibliolic. Um, the name of this poem is Booked. I have maybe 500 books, filling five bookshelves. I read many, peruse all, unread titles staring out as if to accuse me of literary neglect or culpable ignorance. I promise, I swear, I will read them soon, but books keep coming in. Somehow I don't get to it. I need more than one life. Sometimes I pick them up, caress the covers, and gently open their pages like a prospective lover, and then return them to their shelf. Yet another act of book betrayal that I'm sure is being recorded somewhere or somehow by their resentful authors 
their literary labors unrewarded. I'm sure there is a special place in hell for people like me, where one is forced to read all the worst books in the world for the rest of eternity. And you know, I don't, I'm, I'm losing my voice. I think maybe I should give this up. I probably sound terrible. So next time. Thank you, Hugh, and all of our poets. That was great. So we, we like to...